Uh, hi everyone, good evening. Uh, I'm Raju from University of Calgary. Welcome to my talk titled Quantum Teleportation over Deployed Fibers and Applications to Quantum Networks. So before I start, I would like to acknowledge all the funding agencies and all my uh, wonderful colleagues without, which, without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. So now coming to the motivation, why quantum networks? Uh, you can imagine a future quantum network where uh, there are nodes and there are, which possess some quantum devices and all of them connected to each other uh, by which they are able to coherently exchange quantum information between each other. So if you have this kind of network, it will be, it has been shown that it has a lot of applications. For example, one is the quantum communication uh, where you can do quantum key distribution, dance coding, coin flipping, and so on. The other application you can think of is a distributed quantum metrology where the precision of your measurement increases based on the number of particles you increase in your entangled state. And the other main application you can think of is a, a lot of uh, quantum networks, which are network, uh, quantum computers, which are network, uh, by which you can solve uh, uh, large computation problems by distributing the computation between the computers. So, and also quantum teleportation, it's a basic ingredient for development of quantum a repeater, which is a linear quantum uh, network. So you can imagine a future quantum network where there is a data center in the middle, uh, which has some expensive quantum device, and all the users want to uh, access this quantum device and be able to perform some uh, computation uh, using this device. Now, Bob, without having to give his, uh, give access to all the users directly, uh, he can, uh, still allow his device to be used by others by means of uh, an entangled state and a BSM, where each user is able to teleport his quantum state into the expensive quantum device and still be able to do the uh, desired computation. And in the future, you can imagine a lot of users connected to this BSM and being able to access this device and do their necessary computation. So this is how the uh, basic teleportation protocol looks like. We have Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice prepares the qubit that needs to be teleported, and Bob typically prepares uh, one of the four bell states here uh, named idler and signal. And Alice sends uh, the prepared qubit, and Bob sends one of his entangled states, and Charlie perform performs uh, bell state measurement on them. And condition on the bell state measurement, Alice's uh, qubit state is teleported onto Bob modulo some unitary transformation. So based on the bell state, Bob performs the necessary unitary to get back the qubit state of Alice. So this is how we implemented this quantum teleportation in the Calgary Fiber Metro network. So this is the map of Calgary, uh, which shows two fiber links from Bob to Charlie and Charlie to Alice. Uh, each of lengths 11.1 kilometers and 6.2 kilometers. One thing to note is that the B line distances from Bob to Charlie are six point, is 6.2 kilometers, and that B line distance from Charlie to Alice is 2.1 kilometers. Now going into the details of the experimental setup. So in Bob, uh, at Bob station, we prepare time bin entangled qubits, and the way we do it is uh, we use a pulse laser, which is uh, operating at a rep rate of 1047 80 uh, meg uh, at 1047 nanometer. Uh, we use this light and uh, do a second harmonic generation, thereby generating light at 523 nanometers. And we prepare time in, we encode time in qubits using a free space interferometer. And we then generate entangled time means by uh, pumping it uh, onto a SPDC crystal. Here we generate photons at 795 nanometer and 1532 nanometers. Uh, they are further filtered by the use of a fabric perot and a fiber break grating, which has bandwidth of six gig. And Bob will send the telecom photon onto the quantum channel to Charlie. Now to be able to perform the teleportation, all the three stations need to be synchronized. And the way we do it is uh, 
Bob splits part of his light, uh, detects it onto a photo detector, uh, then converts back into light and sends it to Charlie. And the same uh, is done by Charlie, where he's able to send the clock to Alice. Uh, by this way, we have all the three stations synchronized. Uh, now, in the Alice station, uh, Alice prepares the time in qubits that needs to be teleported. And the way we do it is, first Alice creates uh, phase randomized laser pulses by directly modulating the laser. And then we create narrow pulses using a intensity modulator. And then we prepare the time in qubits using a fiber interferometer. And we further filter them to match the same bandwidth uh, of the photons that are being sent by Bob. And then we attenuate it to get it down to single photon level. Uh, now, Charlie, the bell state measurement is done at Charlie. Uh, so if you look at the joint state of Alice's and Bob's photons, that's how it looks like. A for Alice, I and S for idler and signal. And Charlie, in our case, uh, performs a bell state measurement onto psi minus, thereby the signal photon at Bob acquires uh, this quantum state, which is related to the quantum state prepared by Alice. Now, uh, Charlie performs bell state measurement by interfering the photons sent by Alice, on, Alice and Bob on a beam splitter, followed by two uh, SNSPDs. And the signature for a psi minus bell state measurement is a coincidence in, in the opposite detectors in early and late time means. So the main challenge for Charlie to perform this bell state measurement is he needs to make sure that the photons coming from these independent, chan uh, independent channels are indeed indistinguishable at the beam splitter. So he needs to make sure that they have polarization overlap, temporal overlap, spectral and spatial overlaps. Now we ensure the spectral overlap by uh, employing similar filters before uh, they send them to the channel by Bob and Alice. And the spatial overlap is ensured by the use of single mode fibers. Uh, now the tricky part is the polarization overlap. So what we did was we put a PBS, which is a polarizing beam splitter, before the photons interfered on the beam splitter. So now the polarization is the same when they fall onto the interfering beam splitter. But any changes of the polarization in the links uh, will result in intensity fluctuations. Uh, to take into this into account, we employ a polarization tracker uh, followed by a third SNSPD. Uh, what the polarization tracker does is it tries to minimize the amount of counts uh, that is being seen by this third SNSPD, uh, thereby maximizing the overlap between the polarizations on the beam splitter. And that's the result we show there. The red curve is the intensity fluctuations without the feedback, and the blue curve is the intensity fluctuations with the feedback. As you can see, without feedback, we have about 30% intensity fluctuations, and with the feedback, uh, it's reduced down to five, less than 5%. Uh, now, temporal overlap. So the pulses uh, that are being sent by Bob and Alice are of 70 picoseconds wide, and the timing jitter of SNSPDs is about 150 picoseconds. So we cannot use the absolute, we cannot try to find the absolute timing of these pulses uh, to correct for any time arrival differences. So to overcome this problem, uh, we employ the novel approach of observing the degree of home interference. So as you know that when photons fall on a beam splitter, uh, at the same time, and they're indistinguishable in all other degrees of freedom. They tend to bunch, and we don't see any coincidences uh, between the detectors after the beam splitter. Uh, so we first observe the home dip, uh, and we try to uh, stabilize uh, the counts to the coincidences that we observe at the minimum. Any change in the coincidences, we try to correct for it by changing the uh, generation time of qubits at Alice. And that's the result shown in the uh, bottom left side, uh, left hand side there. So the, uh, the green, 
the green points are the amount of coincidences that we see in the Hongo Mandel dip, and the orange curve is the amount of time shift we applied via this feedback to keep the coincidences same. And as you can see, for a time of 1.5 hours, we applied, a, which is the typical scale of our time scale of our measurement, we applied a time shift of about 150 picoseconds, and we are still able to see the same amount of coincidences. So if we didn't apply this feedback, those pulses would have completely missed each other, thereby we, we wouldn't have seen any interference. So now this, uh, after we ensure that the photons are indeed in indistinguishable, we, um, we proceed with the teleportation experiment. So Charlie now sends the result of the Bell state measurement to Bob, and Bob, conditioned on this Bell state measurement, will analyze the his signal photons, which are at 795 nanometer. And we would like to note that these 795 nanometer photons are compatible with thulium quantum memory, which can be stored in the future experiments. Uh, and these photons are analyzed using another free space interferometer here. And if we change the phase of this interferometer, we will see this kind of sinusoidal uh, behavior and we use this to merely align the three interferometers used by Bob and Alice. Now to verify the quality of uh, our teleportation, Alice prepares qubits in uh, eigenstates of X, Y, and Z basis, uh, and we measure the fidelity, which is the overlap with the prepared state, and we see that the fidelities are all above 67%, which is the classical limit for, for this teleportation. Now, we would like to note that this 67% uh, is the 67 limit is only valid for qubits encoded onto single photons. But since we are using attenuated laser pulses, we cannot apply this bond directly. Uh, so we borrow the technique of decoy states, and we calculate the lower bond on the single photon fidelity we get. And these are the results shown. And as you can see, the average fidelity from decoy state method is 80%, and from the standard uh, quantum state tomography is about 78%, which are well above the classical limit of teleportation, uh, thereby showing that we have indeed quantum teleportation. Now, uh, to put our result in context with the other teleportation experiments that have been done so far, we define teleportation distance which is the distance between the Bell state measurement and the photon which receives the teleported state at the time of this measurement. In our case, this is the B-line distance between Charlie and Bob, which is about 6.2 kilometers. And then we have the total state transfer distance, which is the distance between where Alice prepared the state and where the final teleported state is. Uh, has ended up, which is about, which is the B-line distance between Alice and Bob, and it's about 8.2 kilometers. And if we plot all the experiments in this uh, teleportation distance versus state transfer distance, as you can see, we end up there, and the other works are shown as follows. And as you can see, our work sets the record in terms of, along with the work done by uh, Pan's group, uh, which, which is going to be published back to back in Nature Photonics with us. Uh, both of our work sets the record in terms of teleportation distance. On the other hand, if you look at the state transfer distance, there are two famous experiments done by Vienna's group and, uh, and the Pan's group from China, where the total state transfer distance is about hundreds of kilometers, but the teleportation distance is still in the lab scale. Uh, the, one, uh, the one place where this becomes crucial is uh, for the development of quantum repeaters, where for optimal performance of a repeater, the total state transfer distance should be uh, similar to twice the distance of the teleportation distance. And, and it should be in the range of uh, uh, hundreds of kilometers, and we believe the general trend, the general trend points that way. 
So to conclude, we have shown that quantum teleportation is possible over real world fiber networks, thereby paving the way for quantum repeaters. And also the indistinguishability is ensured by the feedback mechanisms employed. And outlook, uh, in the future we will have, a, we are planning to have a star type network uh, in the city of Calgary and finally connect two major cities in the province of Alberta, namely Calgary and Edmonton, which are about 300 kilometers apart by the use of uh, quantum repeaters. Yep, thank you. Uh, any questions? No, I think we're, uh, it's the end of a long day, but thank you very much for uh, a very interesting talk. Um, we thank all of the speakers for the session. Thank you.